Okay, hello. Um, are there any questions? I never really went over the final assignment. It's very similar to the midterm assignment, except for the, the prompts are different. Uh, are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, so as I said at the end last time, there was a kind of uh, important thing that I wanted to talk about that was left over. And um, it starts off from trying to understand, oops, this problem again. Just erase the whiteboard, but. Someday, by the time this is all over, I will actually get everything to work right. Okay. This is, oops, all right. So, um, yeah, it has to do with, or it starts with this thing about how the pre and post paradigm scientists, quote unquote, inhabit different worlds. So um, this, you know, way of talking could mean a lot or not very much, um, depending on exactly how you take it. It could just be a kind of funny way of talking. And um, uh, and one reason to think that it must be just a funny way of talking is that Kuhn knows perfectly well that um, something doesn't change, something you might want to call the world, doesn't change when the scientific revolution happens. Um, and Kuhn, it's almost a piece of technical terminology with him, he uh, again and again registers this by, by making a distinction between seeing and looking at. Right? So he'll say, you know, <laughs> um, that scientists, you know, after the revolution are still looking at the same world, but they see it differently. Or sometimes he says it a more, they see something different. They don't see the same thing, even though they're still looking at the same thing or something like that. Um, so, I mean... That way of talking makes it sound like the different worlds thing is not really very radical, right? I mean, of course, we know that even though we all live in the same world, we don't always see the same thing. Um, I mean, even when we're looking in the same direction, you know, um, uh, there's no... Uh, radical epistemological or metaphysical thesis um, involved in saying that. Um, but uh, so does Kuhn mean something radical by this or not? So Kuhn's um, reaction to this, and you can phrase this question as something like, is Kuhn really a relativist about truth or, you know, something like that. Um, so Kuhn's reaction to that question is, 
I think, to say, well, I can't help talking the way I'm talking now and saying, yeah, we're still looking at the same world, even though we don't see the same thing. Um, but, um, but in fact, the the epistemological or metaphysical uh, facts, so to speak, are in this area are anomalous. Um, and um, he, he takes it as a sign that, I think this is the right way to understand it, that the Cartesian epistemological paradigm is in crisis. So, I mean, you know, how exactly he understands Descartes is probably not worth talking about. Um, it's, uh, I don't see any indication that he spent a long time trying to read Descartes and understand what Descartes really meant. It's kind of a cartoon Descartes. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyway, you know, Descartes is supposed to have originated this epistemological paradigm where there's neutral data that we all get. And if we're looking in the same direction at the same time, we get the same data, but then we interpret them differently. Um, it seems like that, that epistemological paradigm is not supposed to be the same as the paradigm in history or philosophy of science that Kuhn claims to be shifting. Again, when he claims, as he often claims or at least implies, that he's doing something like that. Um, it seems like when it comes to this Cartesian epistemological paradigm, what he's saying is that um, I can point to the, anal to the uh, anomaly, but I don't have a new paradigm on hand. So, assuming I want to keep doing this paradigm-driven, apparently paradigm-driven field of epistemology, <laughs> um, assuming I want to keep doing that, I have to keep using the old language to describe the anomaly. And that's his apology, but not very strong apology for, for continuing to say that we're all looking at the same world, even though we all see it differently. So, so in summary, I think, you know, his answer to the question, so are you a relativist, is something like, um, it seems like the, the, you know, absolutist versus relativist conceptual boxes we have to stuff epistemologies into are not working very well. Um, but I don't have a new set of boxes. So, uh, you know, all I can tell you is, um, I guess I'm, you know, I find myself necessarily trying to be stuffed into the absolutist, that is non-relativist box, but I don't think the fit is very good. Um, okay, so I mean, that that whole little move is very interesting in itself, and there's probably a lot more to, to say about it, but I'm going to go on immediately to talk about what the anomalous epistemological fact is. Um, and um, so the anomaly, I think, is is and again. So I mean, this is going to be confusing, right, for familiar reasons because we're talking about um, a revolutionary change in science, which involved science, you know, empirical anomalies, right? Anomalies in. Uh, uh, in the attempt to fit the old paradigm to, to its data. Um, but at the same time, but that's not the anomaly I'm talking about. I'm talking about what is anomalous from the point of view of this supposed Cartesian paradigm, which says that there's one world that we're all looking at and there's a neutral description of it. And then we tack on some theoretical interpretation one way or the other. So the anomaly is, uh, this is described on page 118, at the very least, as a result of discovering oxygen, 
Lavoisier saw nature differently, right? So, so far we're on this side. We're saying at the very least, he definitely saw something different when he looked at this flask of, you know, transparent gas. <laughs> um, so um, he definitely saw something different so far, we don't have the anomaly, but the next sentence is the anomaly. And in the absence of some recourse to that hypothetical fixed nature that he, quote, saw differently. Maybe I should emphasize that differently. In the absence of some recourse to that hypothetical fixed nature that he, quote, saw differently, the principle of economy will urge us to say that after discovering oxygen, Lavoisier worked in a different world. What he means by the principle of economy here, I'm not sure. I mean, normally that would mean something like you should choose the simplest explanation. It doesn't really seem very apt here. But in any case, leaving aside the question of whether this has to do with the principle of economy, what he's saying is that um, Lavoisier saw, certainly saw something different. We want to say, because of our epistemological paradigm, but he was still looking at the same thing. But um, the question is, what recourse? And recourse here means, you know, access, something like that. What access do we have to this supposedly neutral nature that he or world that he was looking at both before and after the change in in what terms can we describe it or think about it and he's saying you know we don't have neutral terms for that so we can't and so um so some principle or other urges us to say that if there's something that we can't describe or think about, that we shouldn't include it in our uh, explanation of what happened. <laughs> right. So uh, it seems like it might be a stronger principle than the principle of economy, like the principle of you have to know what you're talking about or something like that. But in any case, um, uh, that's what he's saying the epistemological anomaly is. Um, So, I mean, to see, um, like, why Kuhn is saying this about a scientific revolution and how important it is, I want to go back for a second to the duck-rabbit example. Kuhn also goes back and discusses it in this context. So, I guess you know, why he's doing it. Right, there's the duck rabbit. So, um, and you know, there's this gestalt switch. Gest gestalt is the German word for shape. The reason gestalt means this is because there's a school called gestalt psychology that said basically uh, you see the shape before, the whole shape before you see the lines and points that it's made up out of, um, right? So gestalt um, in English comes to mean like a whole that's perceived as a whole before its parts are. So, um, right, so there's a gestalt switch, meaning that, I mean, unlike you know, if there are a case where there's a picture that's not clearly a duck and, after, you know, for it takes you a while to see the duck in it, you know, so you would kind of piece by piece see, oh, there's the beak and there's the, you know, whatever. I mean, in the, and at the beginning, you wouldn't see anything. And as it went on, you'd see a duck more and more clearly. And at the end, you see a duck. But the claim is this switch is not like that. This switch is... You see a duck, it's the whole, or you see a rabbit, it's the whole thing you see. And again, if you can't, I don't know if everyone can see the rabbit, but those are the ears and that's the eye. So, right, so, um, and it's facing up. 
right? So, um, and then all of a sudden everything switches and um, uh, every piece means something different than it did before, right? That is, you didn't somehow clarify your previous perception of a rabbit. All the pieces that, that went up to make a rabbit now all of a sudden uh, make a duck instead. So, you know, Kuhn says that a scientific revolution is like this example in some ways, but not in other ways. It's like this example in that it's relatively sudden. Now, I mean, relatively sudden, meaning compared to that piecemeal process. I guess both of the things I'm saying are compared to that piecemeal project process. It's relatively sudden and it's relatively unstructured is the word he uses for this. And I think both of those are to distinguish it from the piecemeal methodical process of trying to figure out what you're seeing in a picture. Um, which I, I guess even the Gestalt psychologists would admit that we sometimes do this faced with an unclear or unfamiliar picture or, you know, whatever. The, a process of gathering information about what the picture is piece by piece and putting it together until you have the whole picture. Um, I guess you could also say, uh, imagine as an instance of this building a jigsaw puzzle where maybe where you where you didn't have the picture on the box to begin with. So you gradually put it together piece by piece and at the end you see what it is. But as opposed to that, this, this transition, you know, I mean, it doesn't, to say it's relatively sudden is not to say that it literally doesn't take place in time or something, you know, some radical metaphysical thing like that. I mean, you do kind of, like if you've never seen the transition before, someone will say something like, well, look, see that as the beak, you know? And at first you're like, oh, if that's the beak, then it's facing, oh, now I see it, right? So it's, but it's relatively sudden and it's relatively unstructured. There isn't really a method to do to it. You can give someone hints, but you can't tell them step by step how to see the duck if so far they've only seen the rabbit. So Kuhn is saying that scientific revolutions are like this example in those two respects, but they're unlike this example um, in two other very important respects. One is that the scientific revolution is not reversible. We can't go back to seeing the world after we've made the transition from phlogiston chemistry to Lavoisier's chemistry. We can't go back to seeing the world in a phlogiston way. Um, um, and the other is, which is the one that I'm getting at here, that um, in the case of the scientific revolution, there isn't an easy way to say what it is that you're now seeing differently. In this case, we can say what it is is lines on this whiteboard. Right, there are lines on the whiteboard. First, I was seeing them as a duck or as a rabbit. That is, as a picture of a rabbit. Right, I mean, it's important to remember, and I say this every time I teach this class, but <laughs> um, it's important to remember when you think about the duck rabbit example, that it's really strictly speaking a duck picture rabbit picture example. I mean, that's why it's considered by itself, it's relatively tame. Um, it's, uh, it's not as if I brought in an animal in a cage and is hopping around and you were like, oh, a rabbit. And then I said, no, see that as the beak and see that. And all of a sudden you see that it's a duck, 
right? If that happened, you wouldn't know what to say. Um, right? I mean, you wouldn't. Oh, okay. Someone, uh, someone put up a link to a uh, note about the duck rabbit illusion. It's not really an illusion, or I mean, like if if there's an illusion, the illusion is that it's either a duck or a rabbit. There's no duck. There's no rabbit. That's what I'm just saying. There's a whiteboard with some lines on it, right? And that's why this example, um, in and of itself, doesn't raise some question about the reality of the world or anything like that, right? Because when, you know when we switched from seeing the rabbit to seeing the duck. Um, uh, we know, we know that both of those ways of seeing are just ways of interpreting, basically. They're ways of seeing something as something else. Um, but if you imagine, this would be more like a scientific revolution, at least in this respect. I don't know about the irreversibility thing, but in this respect, it would be more like a scientific revolution. If you, again, if you imagine that I bring in a cage with an actual animal and you look at it, and it looks like a rabbit. And all of a sudden, I show you how to see it differently, and now it looks like a duck. So you couldn't say what it was that was in that cage that you were first seeing as a rabbit and now seeing as a duck. Um, now, I mean, we would be extremely surprised, to say the least, if someone could do that with uh, an animal in a cage. Um, but in a sense, that's why scientific revolutions are so surprising, right? That they, they do something like that. You know, like the Voisier, so to speak, brings in a, a, a flask and you look at it and you say, oh, a flask of deflagisticated air or of the air itself entire or whatever. Um, and then he says, but no, see this as this. And you're like, oh, it's a flask of oxygen. Right, and then the question is, um, so this is the way Kuhn puts the question, and I think, I don't know if it's the right way to put the question, but it's very significant that he puts it this way. Where is the external authority or external standard that can tell you what the thing was that was there all along that you first were seeing as deflagisticated air and you're now seeing as oxygen. And he's saying there isn't one, right? Like the only way we had of saying what was in that flask before was to use our old paradigm. Um, I mean, that is the only scientific way that we had of saying. Right, so so there's an issue here, and Kuhn is aware of it, but I'm not. It's not clear exactly what he thinks about it, but you know, he says life in outside the laboratory usually continues just the same as it did before. Right, like you know, uh, if uh, Lavoisier, and and when I say outside the laboratory, that's kind of figurative. Right? I mean, Lavoisier well, could be standing inside his laboratory and someone could say, boy, could you open a window to get some air in here? And, you know, I mean, what they were saying, what they meant, what he did in response to that would apparently be just exactly the same as it was before the revolution. Right. So, I mean, but anyway, like the only scientific way we had of saying before what was in that flask was to use our old paradigm. And the only way we have of saying now what's in that flask is to use our new paradigm. There's no neutral external higher authority to which both of them can submit and say, you know, OK, like you give us the... Um, objective description of what's in this flask and then we'll argue about how to interpret it. According to Kuhn, that would be the role of either a neutral language of laboratory manipulations 
this would be kind of like the view that the protocol sentences are things like blue sphere on the table now or whatever, right? Um, or of a neutral language of sense data, which would be like the view that the protocol sentences are like, you know, blue in the visual field at this position now. Um, so, uh, right, if we had a protocol like that, one of those kinds of protocols of what happened in the laboratory, then, uh, you know, both the pre and the post revolutionary people would, you know, would keep writing the same things in the protocol. We really had a neutral protocol language. And then, uh, uh, they could, you know, uh, then take off from there and say, well, I interpret the protocol this way, you know, and you interpret the protocol that way. I just want to emphasize one last time that although it sometimes sounds like Carnap is trying to do something like that, he can't be, even in the Aufbau, because when he decides what to write in the protocol, it's not calling it that yet, right? When he says what decides what the basic objects are going to be and the fundamental relations, um, he uh, um, he has recourse to empirical psychology, Gestalt psychology, as a matter of fact, right? So. Um, uh, he's not claiming that his whole system is something that uh, um, that's proceeding on a basis that, that previous psychologists would have accepted before the latest research in psychology. All right, but anyway, so that's the way Kuhn is thinking about this quest for the new, for the neutral protocol language. But he say, but he says. Like, that's, that hasn't really succeeded. People have tried over and over, and there doesn't seem to be such a thing. Okay, so why, why am I going on and on about this, uh, especially because I have to get to the new material? Um, well, the reason I'm going on and on about this is because of the political analogy. Um, so... Um, Going way back to the beginning of the reading from last time. Um, so, um, This is Kuhn's description of um, the conditions that bring about political revolutions. Political revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense. And by the way, so Kuhn takes it, I mean, Kuhn takes it that, that po the political sense of revolution is, I guess, not literal because the literal sense of revolution is that something turns over <laughs> right but um but at least the more less metaphorical sense than the scientific revolution i don't know if that's historically true or what but anyway political revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense often restricted to a segment of the political community to a segment of the political community that existing institutions have ceased adequately to meet the problems posed by an environment that they have in part created. Right, so what begins the process of political change um,
So the political system, and I guess we could say normal politics, right? The normal political system consists in what? Well, it's something like puzzle solving. Now, uh, this is already, I hope you can see how radical or subversive a political position this could, this could be. Right? So in other words, what the court system and all that apparatus, the legislators and you know everything are trying to do is to um, um, fit certain facts. And this is the original sense of, sense of facts, like uh, the question of fact, meaning the question of what was done that's raised in a, in a criminal trial. <laughs> um, so like, you know, there, there's certain facts and there's certain boxes that they're supposed to fit into. Um, and the point of the political system is to keep making sure that those things match each other. I mean, he doesn't actually come out and say that, and maybe he's not implying that. Um, but that analogy has to go at least part way. I mean, so at least in any case, what's true is the political system in its normal state is trying to solve problems. Um, and the problems are um, what counts as a problem and what counts as a solution are determined at least in part by the political system. So, um, and so Kuhn says the way a political revolution gets started is that there's an anomaly and it's an anomaly in the following sense that the political system, again, um, uh, Existing institutions have ceased adequately to meet the problems posed by an environment that they have in part created, right? That the political system is failing by its own standards. It says this is something that should be taken as a problem. These are the methods that must be capable of addressing a problem. And yet we can't make those methods address this problem. Now, he doesn't give any examples of this, and I, I'm not going to try, although um, I think it would be really useful to try to think of examples of this, but I just don't have time. Um, so um, I'm just going to go on to the consequence for uh, what political change is like. So, you know... Um, Right, I put a question here. Maybe we sh maybe we shouldn't go so far as to call it puzzle solving. Maybe we should call it problem solving. Right? Maybe he's not literally implying that uh, that the only reason we like solving these problems is because of the challenge of solving them. Um, but he is claiming that they're defined as problems by the political system we have in place at least in part by that. So um, we get an anomaly, and that's why we start feeling dissatisfied with the political system and we get a political crisis. So um, it's not because the political system has failed by some external standard. It's not because, so what would be equivalent to a lang neutral language of sense data here? Let's say a neutral language of human rights. You know, um, you might be able to say, look, uh, this system, it's become apparent that this system is unjust because it's not giving everything the things that they're due. That being the famous, uh, Simonides' definition of justice, quoted in the Republic. It's not giving everyone the things that they're due. Um, 
So it's unjust and that's a crisis and we need a new, better system that will give people the things that they're due, that will be just or at least more just than the old system. Um, and so um, you can at least hope that if that's what political change is like, um, it will be cumulative. Right? When you fix the old system, you will try not to create new injustices. You'll just you'll try to adjust things better so that um, it's closer to the just distribution. And I'm not I mean, we're not necessarily talking about distribution of stuff, right? I mean you're talking about distribution of rights. It could be rights to property, but it could be other kinds of rights. Um, so um, um, so if, you know, um, uh, one way of saying that there is such a neutral language of human rights would be to say, um, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these rights are, right? Like that's the protocol. That's a claim anyway, that that's, that that's what's written in the protocol, right? You say, look, you know, it doesn't matter what your political system is. It's self-evident, it's obvious, right? It's like immediately perceived, so to speak, that people have these rights. And then the question is, is your system giving them those rights or not? Um, as opposed to that, Kuhn is saying, we're in the system. The system defines all rights. There are no rights except the way they're defined by the system. The system defines when it's a problem that someone has something that someone else doesn't, for example, and when it's not. And the only way a crisis can arise for the system is if, again, it turns out that by its own standards, it's not solving the problem, right? By its own standards, it's a problem that so-and-so has more than, than so-and-so. Um, and yet the methods of uh, adjudication and legislation and whatever that are supposed to solve such problems can't solve it. So at that point, as Kuhn is saying, there's a crisis. What happens then? Well, you know, it's supposed to be parallel to a scientific revolution. Um, uh, so, you know, at first it's noticed only by a small portion of the political community that this is going on. They start to focus on it more and more. It starts to take over everyone's attention. Um, there's still no new paradigm though. So people are still trying to solve it using the old system. And then, you know, suddenly someone comes up with a new way of organizing society. And, um, um, and that starts to gain adherence. And at that point, the revolution has started. And um, the analogy between political revolutions and scientific revolutions. Now, again, like Kuhn, um, Oh yeah, see, the PDF I had has this part highlighted and I assume it wasn't originally highlighted in black. It was just how it was photocopied, but in any case, so, but, um, so the, um, um, well, I'll just read here, right. Political revolutions aim to change political institutions in ways that those institutions themselves prohibit. Right? So according to the old system, the new system is illegal, <laughs> um, unjust, more than just illegal. Um, 
right? It doesn't solve the things that the old system considers to be problems using the methods that the old system considers to be legitimate. Um, so their success, meaning the success of the new paradigm, therefore necessitates the partial relinquishment of one set of institutions in favor of another. And in the interim, society is not fully governed by institutions at all. Initially, it is crisis alone that attenuates the role of political institutions, as we have already seen it attenuate the role of paradigms. In increasing numbers, individuals become increasingly estranged from political life and behave more and more eccentrically within it. Then, as the crisis deepens, many of these individuals commit themselves to some concrete proposal for the reconstruction of society in a new institutional framework. And the part that's kind of blocked out here, so I'll just tell you what it says. Actually, I think I wrote it in a, yeah. I don't know if you can see that. No, you can't see that. Um, and once that polarization has occurred, and Kuhn italicizes, political recourse fails. Right, it's that same word recourse that he used in the context of um, the scientific revolution. Um, right, you could say, uh, you know, epistemic recourse fails or something like that. So here again, political recourse fails. There's no external authority that both can apply to. And uh, there would have to be an authority because there is no neutral way of describing the situation. Uh, or, well, okay, if there were a neutral way, that would be the authority. I'm actually not sure which is the right way to put it now that I give those two alternatives. But in any case, right, so, um, and then what makes people go over to the new one? Well, uh, it's going to be have to be analogous to what makes people go over to the new scientific paradigm, which we've already seen part of the answer to this. And I'm going to talk about more of it in a second. Basically, uh, the answer is propaganda, you know, like uh, at best and force at worst. <laughs> um, the techniques of mass persuasion, as Kuhn calls them. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say about the duck rabbits. Right, so the, I mean, I guess so I should just finish up the, the, so the analogy to politics, which Kuhn says, you know, um, I'm taking the term revolution from politics and showing that something similar to that happens in science. And of course, you'll agree that this is what happens in a political revolution. But, you know, what he's, but in fact, what he's saying about political change is in some sense more shocking than what he's saying about scientific change, right? So that like, if you run the analogy backwards and see what he must be saying political change is like, he's saying that uh, you can't expect a cumulative increase in justice from it, that that doesn't even make sense, right? There's not, it's not just that the world is bad and, you know, progress doesn't always happen and sometimes it's reversed or something like that. It's that there is no external standard. What, you know, whatever system comes next will rewrite history to make it look like it was, it was right. And that's what we have in political change. Um, that might explain why Kuhn was not particularly politically active, because if you look at it that way, what's the point? Right? I mean, you could say we're, we're addicted. We're addicted to political um, systems and revolution is just about when something interrupts our addiction and we, we're, is forcing us to kind of wake up that we're trying to go back to sleep, but it would be better to just exit. Um, 
right? Or as they said in that West Coast version of the movement in the 60s, you know, tune in, turn in, drop out. <laughs> that would be that would be the political message. Um, okay, uh, Kuhn doesn't say that anywhere explicitly, obviously, nothing close to that, but you know, you might understand almost why, like, again, there's no point in saying that as a, as a slogan, as a means of mass persuasion. That would just be another way of trying to cause a revolution, which is worthless, right? That's only something you only say to individuals, basically, who can understand it. Um, that's why he wouldn't say it, basically. Not because it's a secret, because there's no point in saying it publicly. It's not a publicly useful thing. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the duck rabbit and, and make one observation about it my, of my own. So there's another way of describing what happens in this example. You can say that um, before we see this example, um, we, before we saw this example, the conceptual boxes we were using to organize the world were, and by the way, did I switch back? Yeah. The conceptual boxes we were using to organize the world were included the concept of a duck picture and the concept of a rabbit picture. So every time you see a picture, you every time you see some lines on a whiteboard, you first try to figure out if it's a picture or something else. And then if you decide it looks like a picture, you try to figure out what it's a picture of. And you know, two of the possibilities are it's a picture of a duck and it's a picture of a rabbit. And what you learn or what you could learn from this example is that that conceptualization won't work, right? I mean, it's not true that uh, everything is either a picture of a rabbit or a picture of a duck or a picture of something else that's not a rabbit or a duck. Um, here's something that you can't say whether it's a picture of a rabbit or a duck or neither or both. It just doesn't fit, right? I mean, it just turns out that that's not, uh, that's not a question that has a simple yes or no answer. So, um, after we learn that, we have to regard this as just lines on the whiteboard. We realize that the description of it as a picture of a duck or a picture of a rabbit was not objective. It was merely subjective. Um, uh, it can change without anything changing here. So um, it's observer relative, right? So we, um, so now, I mean, we may, we may not be able to learn to see it as just lines on the whiteboard, and that's important, right? We still only can see it as either a picture of a duck or a picture of a rabbit. It's very hard, I mean, at least if I had drawn it better, that, I think that would be the case. <laughs> I did this, this one is a particularly poor example of the duck rabbit. But, um, but, you know, it's very hard to, if not impossible, to look at lines that are a picture of something and not see a picture, but just see lines. So, you know, we still may need to see it as a picture of a duck or a picture of a rabbit. In our everyday life, nothing has changed, but now we know it, there's really no such thing as a picture of a duck or a picture of a rabbit, right? I mean, not in the sense that they, you know, it could exist, but it doesn't exist anywhere, like maybe a unicorn or something, but in the sense that the concepts don't work the way they're supposed to. Um, and, you know, notice that that transition is not reversible. So, like, if you wanted an analogy to a scientific revolution, that would actually be more promising. And what happens there 
without appealing to an external authority, we learn better what it is we were looking at. So, I mean, I like this is pr maybe the only time in the course I'm going to like say something really straightforward about how I would approach the philosophy of science if this were a course about me rather than about these other people. <laughs> that, like, that's the promising place to start. But uh, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, now back to Kuhn. How much time do I have left? All right. Um, okay, right, so there's, there's basically like one short thing I want to talk about and then the rest of it is all one long thing. So the short thing is just the thing I already alluded to before, you know, um, uh, and I think I already talked about this last time some too, but but Kuhn says the most about it in um, this reading. So like what makes people choose the new paradigm? What leads to its success, to its initial success? What leads it to uh, replace the old paradigm? It's not gonna be proof that's acceptable under the terms of the old paradigm, that the new paradigm is right. Because again, there is no neutral language that they can both use. What is it? So Kuhn says, this is, I'm not gonna show you the text, but this is around page 153 through 156, um, that the most common thing that is urged in favor of a new paradigm is that it's claimed that it can solve the problem that caused the crisis in the first place. Um, um, and many times it actually does solve that problem. Although Kuhn says it's not necessary that it actually solve that problem. Both because First of all, sometimes you claim that it can solve that problem, even though it really can't. <laughs> That's pretty much what he says Copernicus did. I don't know the details of this, so I, you know, I, I, um, I'll, I just have to take him at his word because he, he does know the details. He wrote a whole book about this, you know. So, um, but like. Um, he says that, you know, the, the anomaly that caused the crisis was an anomaly in explaining the length of the solar year, and people were worried about it because of the calendar reform, and uh, Copernicus claimed that his theory could solve this problem, but in fact, in its initial version, it didn't do any better than the Ptolemaic theory. So it didn't really solve the problem. Um, but at least Copernicus, Copernicus claimed it solved the problem. So that's a type of thing that can uh, bring people over. Um, but sometimes it's even acknowledged that it doesn't solve the original problem, but meanwhile something else has come out, so to speak. Uh, so um, um, just because in that period of extraordinary science, people tried out all kinds of weird things, and sometimes it turn, you turn up something that doesn't solve the original anomaly that caused the crisis, but solves all kinds of other unsolved problems, or makes new surprising predictions. Um, uh, so, um, which then turn out to be true. Um, or sometimes it doesn't even do that. And Kuhn says, this is the way it mostly works. Sometimes it's just that once the new paradigm is on the table, people think it's kind of cool. <laughs> right? Kuhn says it's like aesthetic considerations by which he means, and I don't know if this is consistent with what he says about art elsewhere in the book, but by which he means that there isn't really a good reason. It's just subjective. It seems neat to me. Um, so basically, as, as I said, what's going on here is propaganda. And, it's, and it's, it's propaganda aimed at what? 
it's aimed not at persuading people that according to some objective standard, the new one is better than the old one, although that may be part of the rhetoric. Um, but what it aims at basically is convincing people that it's going to be more fun to solve problems in the new one than it was in the old one. The old one, because of this anomaly, because of this crisis, is not very fun anymore. <laughs> right? It, it has Pauli saying, uh, I wish I had been a movie comedian or something of that kind. I'm not having fun solving these puzzles anymore the way I used to. And what you have to do is convince people. Um, and in the nature of the case, you can't offer them you know, demonstrative evidence of this, or even of the probability of it, really. You just have to get them to somehow believe that, you know, solving puzzles under the new rules is going to be better. That's how the revolution ends, according to Kuhn, when enough people are convinced of that. That is, enough scientists, because it's important. It has nothing to do with people who aren't scientists or for scientists who are not in this field. Um, okay, so I mean, in a sense, this ends Kuhn's answer to the demarcation problem, right? What makes science different from other fields? You know, the main part of the answer was the answer about normal science. Science is different from other fields because scientists have this rigid education and, you know, uh, so on and so forth that allows them to regard what they're doing as solving puzzles. Um, and, uh, and moreover, there's, here's what happens when that breaks down. They don't stop solving puzzles. They uh, try to solve them on the old rules as long as they can, but until someone proposes a new set of rules that seems more promising, and then they all switch to that. So, but this leaves over a problem. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's basically the problem that, as I've been saying all along throughout the whole course, gets philosophy of science started. Um, wait, you know, why were we interested in what makes science different from every other field? Um, because science seems to be, have made and be still making this amazing progress. And it's the progress that philosophy doesn't make. I mean, it's the progress that some other fields also don't make, but we're philosophers and this is, you know, philosophy is about self-knowledge. What we're really, this is what's really worrying us. Um, so, um, so Kuhn, needs to explain why, if science is the, is the kind of activity he described it as being, why is that the kind of activity that makes this amazing progress? Um, and I mean, that is, and to address that question, of course, he has to say what distinguishes it from the other field, what, right, why being like that um, causes a field to make progress and not being like that causes it to not make progress. So he divides um, all the created fields into the ones that do make progress and, oops, sorry, and the ones that don't. So the ones that do make progress are science, technology, and I'm saying according to Kuhn, right? The ones that do make progress are science, technology, and art before a certain time, he says. 
he doesn't say exactly what time, but he seems to be thinking of uh, like the sometime around the early 20th century. Um, and then we have the type of creative fields or disciplines that don't make progress. And here we have modern art, <laughs> um, philosophy, um, political theory, Presumably he says political theory because political practice, maybe it's not really a creative field or a discipline, but we've already said it's analogous to science. Maybe we expect that it will make progress, right? Like the way po political societies are actually arranged. But the theory about it is an example, he says, of something that doesn't make progress. And, you know, here, I guess in science, maybe I should say hard science or, well, mature science. Because down here we have immature science. Right? Meaning um, the sciences that are now matured, physical science and life science, uh, before they had their first paradigm, and the sciences that are still not mature now. I wonder why my board so, turned so blue. And the sciences that uh, are still not mature now, which um, Kuhn uh, most of the time seems to think includes the, or likely includes the social sciences. Um, I should have a way to change the color balance here, but I'm not seeing it. Um, maybe it'll, it'll heal itself. Um, so the question is, why do the ones on this list make progress and the ones on this list don't? Now, I think as far as technology goes, and this is uh, a really striking omission <laughs> that Kuhn never really says why technology makes progress. Um, I mean, uh, it doesn't need science to make progress, Kuhn says, Kuhn, because Kuhn says every culture everywhere always has technology, and I guess it's always making progress. Um, anyway, it certainly made a lot of progress before there were any mature sciences in his sense. So it doesn't. Technology does not need science to make progress. Um, why does it make progress? Um, I mean. I, I assume his answer is some kind of like natural selection type of answer. Um, I mean, he says that he draws an analogy between scientific change and natural selection also, but I guess the difference is the criteria. Here, the criteria for whether a technology survives have to do with whether it actually works. Um, we don't get to decide what the rules of puzzle solving are, right? So that's, so that's why the type of progress that technology makes is gonna be quite different from the type of progress that science makes. Um, in any case, as I said, Kuhn uh, d just doesn't address that. All he says is that be although these fields are very different, uh, although science and technology are very different, they both make progress, and so we tend to confuse them with each other and not realize how different they are. 
So again, Kuhn's demarcation line, unlike Popper's, is going to run between these two. He doesn't want to include engineering in the definition of a mature science. Um, and of course, that would be implausible given his definition of mature science, right? I mean, engineers are not trying to solve puzzles that they've set the rules of. Someone else tells them, we need a bridge over this river, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the puzzle. Um, and the, what counts as success, they also don't get to decide, right? If I try to cross their bridge and I fall into the river, I say, sorry, you did not succeed. <laughs> I don't care what your standards of success are, but if this is not a success, you're fired, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, um, okay, so, um, so, Anyway, whatever explains the progress of technology won't work for science. And the question now is, why does science make progress and these don't? He seems to imply that art before that period of time basically was a mature science. I'm not sure if he wants to go that far. But in any case, he doesn't say how it was different from a mature science. It doesn't, unlike technology, it doesn't, he doesn't seem to think that, well, I don't know. He doesn't say one way or the other. I guess you could imagine it was kind of like technology. It had an external standard. In any case, um, okay, so the question again is what makes an activity within Kuhn's demarcation line not only uh, um, capable of making progress at all, which you might wonder uh, already, but, but like super good at making progress. So there's basically two parts of the answer. And um, um, the two parts of the answer are, put this up. The two parts of the answer are about progress in normal science and progress through revolution. So, um, so why does normal science make progress? And I think Kuhn's general answer to that is found um, on page 162. Um, So the resolution, he's basically posed that question. And he says it's more than one question. That's why it's plural. But he's basically posed that question about progress through normal science. And he says the resolution of that question will depend in part upon an inversion of our normal view of the relation between scientific activity and the community that practices it. Inversion, again, like this is the literal sense of revolution turning over. He mentioned that also when he mentioned the example of the person wearing the inverting lenses, 
right? That at first when you wear these lenses that make everything look upside down, or sorry, at first when you wear these lenses that reverse the image that comes into your eyes, everything looks upside down. But then um, after a while, more or less suddenly, it all flips and looks right again, um, right? And when he said that, he said it like it was an example both of in a revolution both in the literal and the metaphorical sense meaning re the literal sense is inversion turning over right so when he says the resolution of these questions requires an inversion of our normal view he's saying again um that what he's doing here is an example of a revolution right in order to un to resolve this anomaly of why it is that normal science makes progress um, which the induction theory and the falsification theory have made uh, seem really difficult. Uh, we have to look at things upside down, so to speak. We have to see things differently. Um, and specifically, he says, we must learn to recognize as causes what have ordinarily taken to be, been taken to be effects. So what does that mean? Well, um, it means, for example, um, if you ask someone before, why is it that before uh, Galileo and Newton, physics was full of these competing schools? But once Galileo and Newton came along, this, all those schools went away and there was just one school. There was, there was just physics. So you might have thought that the answer to that would be something like in the old days when physics wasn't making any progress, um, uh, no one was making any progress. So there was no clear reason to, to choose one of these schools over another. None of them were getting anywhere, and that's why they just kept fighting with each other forever. You know, and if you ask someone about some of the contemporary social sciences, they'll say, and that's what's going on there. They're just fighting over method and whatever because none of them know how to make, I'm dropping a lot of stuff today. No one, none of them know how to make any progress. But once they saw the light and started on the true path of a science, as Kant puts it, um, then of course there was no longer, and this is what Kant claims he's gonna do for philosophy, right? There was no longer any reason for this continual debate back and forth because all of a sudden it became clear which direction you have to go. Um, whereas Kuhn is going to say a big part of the reason normal science makes progress is that it only has one school. <laughs> so it's, um, he says every school always made progress by its own standards. I don't know if this is true at all, historically speaking, by the way. I think actually a lot of schools are constantly of certain kinds, philosophical schools included. Philosophical schools didn't do exactly what Kuhn describes normal scientists as doing either. But in any case, like uh, a lot of schools of various times are always kinds are always describing themselves as degenerate, right? Like the founders were great. But we latter people are, you know, struggling to understand them. And, you know, we can't make big decisions the way they did. All we can do is make little comments. And, but in any case, Kuhn says every school is always making progress by its own standards. Uh, maybe you should say, you could say, even though they didn't think of themselves that way, we can see that they were making progress by their own standards or something like that. So, um, so... Uh, like, in other words, so if you just focused on one little strand of the pre-paradigm period, you would see progress being made. But um, 
Um, but when you looked at it as a whole, you don't see progress because no one agrees on what counts as progress. So like what well, one school is making progress in, the other school says you're getting worse and worse. <laughs> um, whereas now there's only one school after the first paradigm, there's only one school and uh, it gets to define what counts as progress. And so of course the whole field is making progress. Um, um, moreover, that one school that's left, he says, is making better progress because it doesn't have to waste its time arguing with other schools. It can just try to solve its own puzzles. So it gets deeper and deeper into its own puzzles and it doesn't have to worry about like starting again from the basics. Um, so again, we've learned to see what we thought was the effect as the cause. We thought that, sci that a mature science was unified and didn't involve this kind of bickering about fundamentals because it was making progress because it was on the sure path of science, but Kuhn is telling us it's the other way around. It's because they eliminated all their rivals that they're now making progress. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the other reasons he gives for why normal science makes progress, I think are similar. Um, he's, I should have left mine in there. This is one school. And I'm going to write also that it's insulated. Normal science makes progress because, um, uh, I was alluding to this before, no one else gets to decide what counts as progress in normal science except the scientists themselves. They're only talking to each other. Right? Remember, he made this point a long time ago. Once the first paradigm sets in, before the first paradigm, the people who are working in the field write books that are accessible to basically the general educated reader. Um, once the first paradigm sets in, the, their discourse quickly becomes more and more um, difficult for outsiders to understand. They're not talking to outsiders anymore. They're only talking to each other. And, um, um, and that allows them to make progress quickly because, uh, you know, they can, first of all, focus only on solving the problems, the puzzles that they think likely have a solution. Things, ones that seem too hard using the methods specified by the paradigm are just set aside as too difficult. Um, so they're working only on the puzzles they think will be solvable and they're the ones who are deciding what counts as a solution. So um, they start solving lots of puzzles really fast. Again, you might have thought that the reason that a mature science is insulated from um, should be insulated from outside interference is that the scientists really know what they're doing. Um, and um, um, that the scientists really know what they're doing and that outsiders are not qualified to tell them what problems are worth working on or uh, what counts as a solution, what's interesting and what's not, right? This is why we should have peer review. That's what you might, and you might think why, because, um, Obviously, the scientists know what they're doing. Look at well, the progress they're making, right? So because the, this field is making progress, it obviously they obviously know what they're doing, and we shouldn't interfere. 
But Kuhn is saying, again, it's the other way around. It's because they manage to keep other people from interfering with their field that they're able to make progress. That what it's it's because they manage to keep other people from interfering with their field that they're able to do something that counts by their own standards as progress. Right? As opposed to again, the question is why do engineers make progress? Um, but as opposed to uh, um, like Kuhn gives the example of sociologists. Kuhn says they don't get to decide for themselves what problems are interesting to work on. People are telling them, you know, we really need to understand the problems about racism and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And those are the interesting problems. Um, so since they haven't managed to screen themselves off from that kind of demand, they're not making progress, he says. And the last one here is uh, ignorance of history. <laughs> Again, you might think that this is the effect of rapid progress, right? Because a mature science is galloping ahead so fast, the old things, you know, quickly become outdated and uninteresting. And that's why scientists just, uh, you know, don't read old books and papers, you know, the way philosophers do, at least some philosophers sometimes still do uh, in certain ways. But in any case, um, uh, the scientists don't uh, do that, you might think, because they're making so much progress. But again, Kuhn says it's the other way around. It's because the paradigm's victory is complete and it gets to rewrite history in such a way as not to present any alternatives to its way of doing things to the student. This is, again, is a feature of the rigidity of scientific education. As he puts it, right? So because um, someone who's trained in the mature science is not constantly worrying about whether these rules are, the, are good rules or not, um, they can really focus on trying to solve the puzzle. And so, so normal science, um, this is another part of what allows normal science to make such rapid progress. Someone asked, I don't know when, so would, should we think about immature science as incomplete science or science that cannot be completed? That is an excellent question. Um, you know, so the very term mature suggests the first one of those alternatives, right? Namely, that the immature sciences are not mature yet. Um, and Kuhn definitely thinks of it that way. The one maybe exception is this thing he says about art, which seems to have made a reverse transition, right? And remember way back when, when he talked about solving the jigsaw puzzle, he said, or, or what else you could do with the pieces other than solving the puzzle, he said, you know, you could try to make a picture with them the way a child or a contemporary artist might. Right? Meaning like the, the contemporary or modern artist is an example of someone who is not solving puzzles anymore, um, but doing something else, something that might well be better and would certainly be more original, as Kuhn puts it there, in solving puzzles. But except for that one exception, you know, throughout the book, Kuhn, uh, you know, constantly... Well, and I guess technology would be an exception here too, but you know, but except for those two important exceptions, throughout the book, Kuhn, you know, says that, um, you know, there's this line between immature and mature, and various sciences have crossed it one after another throughout history, and he seems to imply that the other ones are just haven't crossed it yet. Um, and that's what Kuhn isn't the only one in this period, or maybe even now. I guess this wouldn't be fashionable now. 
but he isn't the only one in this period to talk about mature sciences versus immature sciences. And it's, you know, and they do, they have, a, I think, a common perception that there's an order of sciences from, you know, hardest or most exact to like softest or least exact. And that, uh, um, that that same order is also a chronological order of when they, so to speak, separate from philosophy and become sciences or become mature sciences. And that like mathematics did it first and then astronomy and then dynamics. And then, you know, like Kuhn has a whole detailed order of it. Um, whether that's true or not, or whether he even should say that or not is another question. Right, like as I said just in passing, philosophy is about self-knowledge. Could philosophy, you know, when physics, after it got its first paradigm, physicists stopped having to argue with each other about what physics is. That's one of the ways Kuhn puts it. And instead they got to start arguing about, or not really arguing, but they started to get it to start to solving physical problems. Could philosophy make a transition like that and still be philosophy? I mean, maybe making a transition like that, unfortunately, but uh, um, but could it still be philosophy under after that transition? In other words, could philosophers stop arguing about what philosophy is? Um, that seems like it wouldn't be philosophy. But even sociology, you know, you could say, could they really? Um, stop worrying about what sociology is? Isn't sociology itself a really interesting sociological phenomenon um, in a way that physics is not an interesting physical phenomenon? Um, so like I said, that's a good question. I suspect that Kuhn is giving the wrong answer to it, um, but, uh, but he's not alone in that respect. Um, all right. Um, so, um, right, so what's left is progress through revolutions. And like on the one hand, the way I think this book is usually seen, this is the big question, right? Like how can there be progress through revolutions? Um, but I feel like by the time we get to this, the answer is kind of anticlimactic if you really understand what he's saying. Um, I mean, there's two parts to the answer. The most obvious, but also most disappointing part to the answer is that um, the new paradigm uh, defines what counts as a better theory. The old paradigm is gone, <laughs> right? Uh, um, uh, the few elderly hand holdouts for the old paradigm have died. <laughs> so history is written by the victor. Um, but uh, Kuhn says in an unusually strong sense because of all these other factors, like the fact that there's only one school and it's insulated from anyone else, there's no one else to tell the victor what they have to write. <laughs> so they, they just write it from their own standards. That's, that's the only standards they have, right? It's not like this, this isn't like deceitful. There isn't someone like, he compares it to Orwell, right? But there isn't someone like, you know, I forget who this is, but like the party boss person, the inner party person in the, towards the end of 1984, who like explains, oh yeah, this is our plan. The party is like a boot stepping on the human face throughout history or something like that. There's no conspiracy, right? But this is just the only way the people who have been trained in the new paradigm know how to understand history is the one that makes them look like progress over the old paradigm. So of course there's going to be progress. 
right? Even if someone standing outside, like a historian like or philosopher like Kuhn, might say, well, you gained some things and you lost others. I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, but if you at least if you let scientists tell the history, then there definitely is going to be progress through the revolution. Um, the other answer is a little bit less, a little bit less disappointing, um, but it's also more questionable. Yeah, no, someone said something about 1984, but that's not quite right. But in any case, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so um, it's a little bit more questionable, which is um, Kuhn explains, at least this is the way I understand it, um, a new paradigm is often usually chosen because it seems to solve more problems than the old one could. It seems to promise to solve more problems than the old one could. It's, so, I mean, this would be less disappointing because in a sense this shows why you expect a certain kind of accumulation, right? Like the old, the new paradigm is uh, not like, you know, if the old paradigm was Newtonian mechanics, which can make a lot of very precise predictions about all kinds of things, um, it's going to be hard to get uh, physicists to abandon it in, in favor of relativity theory if it turns out that relativity theory, you know, according to relativity theory, apples should shoot up into the sky rather than falling on your head. Right? I mean, um, so a, at least a certain kind of problem or puzzle or a certain class of them that is, you know, considered central by the practitioners of the field has got to be Redescribed under the new paradigm in such a way that they still have a solution in ter under the terms of the, old, of the new paradigm. But again, that's first of all is very, you know, it's only on the whole, right? It's you know, uh, Kuhn uh, repeatedly gives the example of the fact that phlogiston theory could explain why all the metals had something in common, because they all they're all compounds of phlogiston. Whereas the new theory couldn't explain it at all. It's just there are these things that happen to be shiny and ductile and whatever. Um, and in any case, remember, a lot of this is propaganda, right? Like, I mean, a lot of times the new paradigm hasn't really been worked out very well, for example. Like, it's really hard to solve the uh, field equations of general relativity. For a long time, I think there was only one known self-consistent solution, <laughs> the Schwarzschild metric, I mean, other than the flat solution. So, um, uh, uh, so like the claim that it can solve all the problems is a little bit hand wavy. You make certain approximations, but it's not clear why they're legitimate, and then you can kind of get out this limiting case and whatever. Um, um, so anyway, like I said, that second part of the solution is, I mean, it still just amounts to re accumulation of ability to solve puzzles, not necessarily accumulation of anything useful, right? In fact, Kuhn says straight out, we may have to, part of the revolution that he's suggesting is we should give up thinking of science as progressing towards the truth. And just think of it as progressing, getting better than it was to begin with, but better at what? Better at solving puzzles. 
Um, so, uh, okay, there's one minute left in the course. <laughs> there's one minute left of the quarter. So uh, there's a couple of other things I should I could say, but I just I want to. Um, um, just end by coming back to something I said in answer to uh, Alvaro's question before, which is, um, well, it's a combination of two things. Number one, what is Kuhn really advocating? What is he doing? Is he trying to introduce a paradigm into philosophy of science? Um, and if so, why? And in any case, what advice does he give? What does he actually recommend to the careful reader? It seems like he may recommend um, exiting institutions. And they say it's the nature of, uh, well, I mean, there, maybe there can be a kind of institution, the discipline of engineering or of modern art or something that's worthwhile belonging to, but uh, for the most part, the uh, institutions are um, set up to succeed by their own standards and to keep you from questioning whether you need an institution like that even when they fail. Um, so, I mean, that's, so, I mean, I guess that's the summary of Kuhn is, it seems like the answer in the end to the question that philosophy asked about science, why is science so great, was, is according to Kuhn that it's not. Now, I, I mean, I actually, to again betray my own opinions, I don't actually think Kuhn is right about that. Um, but, um, but I do think that a lot of the data he has about science are right, that in other words, it shows that it's a hard problem to explain why science isn't what he's saying it is. It's not, he didn't make some obvious mistake. It, it shows that we re that philosophers really still don't understand very well what science is and why it makes progress. Um, and the other, the last thing I want to say is, and therefore we still really don't understand the thing that we really need to know here, which is um, why is science not philosophy and vice versa? Okay, um, thank you all. And uh, um, I'm not planning to do regular office hours next week, but if you, uh, if you wanna to talk to me, let me know and we can make an appointment. Um, right. So other than that, I'll just say again, thank you um, and have a great break.